actually. And But we decided to do something a bit different. And my thought was, you know, what I hear from our thousands of people that use self space is the reoccurring theme around loneliness. And mm -hmm. so we decided to do something which was a bit more about movement towards connection. So we're doing a hundred person dinner in the middle of Cold Rock's Yard. Nobody knows each other. And we're going to have um, menu cards for conversation. So it's an opportunity to 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 kind of combat a bit of loneliness actually and, mm. and be together and connect so I'm excited I'm fairly nervous it feels like a big thing to pull off 100 people dinner but it's um and all of the money so the ticks we sold some tickets which sold very quickly and all of the money is going back to a bursary for more marginalized um people young people for therapy sessions so it's all mm. in a kind of good cause so yeah. that's exciting yeah that's, yeah that's such that's 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 such a nice feel good event on all sides I think but I, and also I feel like the people who are turning up they kind of know what they're letting themselves in for don't they I think so and I think we want to be we want to be challenged someone's saying Cold Drops Yard is a cool venue it is it's such a great I mean our King's Cross I remember from years ago because I went to drama school there was just hideous and now it's just a really I think it's a really diverse kind of cultural mix and I do think we want to be challenged into connecting with people actually you know that kind mm. of nervousness about meeting people and yet I think we really need it. I think we we so need meaningful connection. Um, so yeah. I'm hoping that people have a taste of that. Um, but let's yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what you guys do so well. You well, you create the space. You just create those like containers for people to come and try new things. So I think with the, a book like this. Again, we know we kind of know what we're letting ourselves in for when we start to read a book about therapy. Obviously, people in shelf help might be reading it because I've suggested it, but but they're still choosing to kind of come along for the ride. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like you kind of know what you're letting yourself in for, but equally, the book is very, um, it just takes you through lots of different layers of yourself. So like, all the different kind of layers, like less like um, time for reflection and prompts mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. And yeah. so was that the kind of, was that the objective of it to be like a kind of taster into therapy? A little bit. It was it, it, basically we're really focused on proactivity around mental health. So culturally in the UK, we often don't get help or talk to someone until we hit crisis point. And then mm. we go to the doctor, which is where sick people go. And so this whole idea around our mental health and and proactive approach to to our well-being when we launched self space wasn't really a thing you know if you went to therapy there was something wrong with you and i really disliked that um sentiment because i think like everything in our body in our world if we don't work it if we don't flex those muscles when we do hit choppy waters which we all will we won't be able to have the tools we won't be able to have the stamina to kind of manage and get through it's not to say we're never going to feel rubbish because that is being human you know mm. episodes of depression anxiety all of these things are, are very a normal human experiences a prolonged experience of it different but but i i we, i think chance and i really wanted to get to a place where there was a book that you could pick up whatever you were going through and you could find something in there to to support you, maybe some tools, something practical that you could actually do rather than an abstract idea. So that's kind of where the idea of it came from. Um, I was telling you we were writing it in COVID, so it was... Um, it was kind of a dark time, actually, in the world. And this was a bit of an anchor point to, okay focus inwards what do we know what do we know works how can we survive difficult periods and that's kind of where the book book sort of came from um mm. but I do think I I mean I know that a lot of my friends and and also my clients will say oh I read that chapter on separation and divorce or I read that chapter on um comparison and it was really helpful it's it, and it's not too meaty I think sometimes when we're in a difficult place the last thing we want is like dense reading which we can't really make any sense of so you can even just flip yeah. to the prompts and not read the chapter and I think they're useful um but yeah it's um it, I was saying to you I hadn't really looked at it I think when you write something depending on what your relationship is with it 
sometimes it can be strange to look at it again. And sometimes I read bits, like some people post things out of it and I'll say, well, that's nice. And, oh, I wrote that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's good, that. Oh, right. I can't even recognise my own voice sometimes. It's um, it's a curious thing, actually, but um, I, I do feel proud of it, actually. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and it must be strange when people kind of quote it back to you. Um, yeah. Because I suppose, because in therapy, the, the relationship is very, um, well, it's quite one way, I suppose. Mm -hmm. People that don't necessarily know much about you as their therapist, so you're used to kind of being in these situations where you're hearing everything about everybody else, but, mm. but you share your story in this book and, and yes. throughout the book, both of you, you and Chance both do as a ways to say, um, you share stories um, from clients as well, but it's like, this is, this is how, how we began. This is kind of how we came to therapy and yeah. these are the experiences we've had. So I think that's, um, that's probably, people probably love to read about that. Oh, so everyone's so curious. I mean, I don't know. I've been in therapy for a very long time and I, know nothing because I had very old school therapists and Chance and I think a bit more um, kind of in the current world in terms of how we work clinically we do share a little if it's helpful but yes the the you know the idea in therapy is that your therapist is an almost blank canvas that you can project mm -hmm. onto so knowing too much or you know it they don't often clients or people so yeah we wrote a little bit about our beginnings in here and I definitely think you can hear our tone in the book and there's some personal references and we're all messy. You know, we're all complicated, mm. messy humans. Being a therapist doesn't alleviate you from any of the normal stresses of life. And um, I think there's a misconception around that in terms of a therapist, you know, and their kind of perfect ability mm. to cope with life. Yeah, I think we're just normal, <laughs> the same as everyone else, you know, ups and downs and struggles and mm. um, yeah. And do you yeah. do you mind sharing then for the people who haven't read the book yet, because we're starting our read along next week. So no, there's <laughs> no shade on that. But um, do you mind sharing a bit about your personal story and also how you came to go to therapy and then become a therapist yourself? Because it sounds like it's been a, a, quite a journey it's been a journey I mean I've been a therapist now for like 24 years so it feels feels well bedded in um but before that I was a wildlife presenter so I was a television presenter and um I came from quite a dysfunctional family or do come from you know a fairly dysfunctional family I can say now looking at it but at the time you don't really know because this is just what your kind of this is what your you know. life we there was no talk it was a very much we were in survival mode and um there wasn't any room for feeling there was no talk about feelings in my family it's similar to chance actually but it wasn't no one ever said how are you or mm -hmm. you know that you know acknowledgement of feelings and I kind of I went into telly not really knowing why I wanted to be on the telly um until I went to therapy later actually but I just knew I needed to be on the telly got very lucky, did wildlife for four or five years and a game show, which ended my career actually. <laughs> but but I can remember I was in the Bahamas and I was doing a shoot with the dolphins and I can remember speaking to my mom on the phone and I think it was before mobile phones, like I'm that old, but if it, she and, and she said, how is it, you know, what's it like? And I was like, oh, I'm so unhappy. And she mm. said, what do you mean? You're in the Bahamas doing a TV programme. And I was just like, I don't know. I just can't find any. I I, I could, didn't have the words for it. But what I wanted to say and what I was trying to say is I don't find any meaning in what I'm doing. Mm. And I felt empty inside in terms of my own connection to this this thing I'd wanted so much. And there I kind of arrived at it. And so that was when I decided, OK, I'm going to leave telly, which was quite a critical career, actually. You know, it was a lot about what you looked like, not who you were. Your value and your worth is about, oh, she's a bit fat or she's a bit. I can remember that was the narrative around that. So I'd kind of I left TV and I felt a bit I felt like just very flat and didn't really know 
kind of what I wanted to do. What I did know was that I wanted to inhabit the opposite pole to the one I'd been inhabiting. So I, what, what was the opposite of presenting or putting something on? Oh, okay, feeling. Oh, I don't know much about feeling. That's not something I, oh, hang on a minute. And somebody, I'd heard somebody on the bus years ago talking about drama therapy MA, and I must have lodged it somewhere in my psyche because mm -hmm. I kind of... Just there percolating. Yeah, percolating. Yeah. I applied and I got a call from the course leader. It was an MA. And he said, look, you don't have a degree. I didn't have a degree. We couldn't afford to go to uni in my family. And um, he said, you know, we can't accept your application because you don't have a degree. And I said, well, can I meet you? Because I, I can write something for you and, and I really want to have an opportunity. So he asked me to go to interview and they did offer me a place. And I was the last person in the UK to do that course without a degree. So um, that was quite amazing. And I did my MA and I and during that course, you have to do so many hours of therapy. And I can remember arriving. I had a Jungian analyst. And she was very old school. And I could have read arriving in an Addison Lee with my sunglasses on, full on telly mode. And um, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I don't need to be here. I mean, I'm only here because they're making me do it on the course. And she was like, okay. Seven years later, <laughs> when I left her, <laughs> she was like, I think you probably did need to be here, Jodie, didn't you? And I was like, yeah, I think I did. So that was well, had you never Had you never thought about going to therapy yourself before? Had it, it, no. Is that because it wasn't something that was talked about or kind of, it was just not on the radar? It just wasn't on the radar. And if you're not fine, then what's wrong with you? And I had such a disconnect from my own feelings that I would never really have imagined that there was work that I could do to help myself feel better or that talking about something with someone else Mm. to help you sort it out or just see things differently would be so alleviating um and yeah so I've been in therapy pretty much ever since I I feel like there's a responsibility to to my work to keep working on myself um I often really dislike going I'm not gonna lie but I've <laughs> persevere I don't know do you have therapy do you feel like that sometimes um, I used to, I had therapy for two years and right. I shared, I did, um, I did a kind of blog post about it this week, actually, to, to kind of talk about the book and things. And I, and I said exactly what you just said at the beginning. And it's like, what's the point? What's the point of just talking about myself? Like, I don't know. I, I, my thing was like, I don't even get any homework. Like I, cause I started reading the books and like doing, you know, doing the things and stuff. Yeah. And then, yeah. And I, I wonder for you, Jodie, was there a point, was there like an epiphany? Was there a moment when you were like, this shit actually might be working or, yeah, or was it definitely. like a slow grad gradual? Yes. No, there was a really big, I mean, look, I don't believe therapy works in big eureka moments. I think it's a constant accountability, showing up, doing the hard shit, being really present for yourself. But I had a moment. So I was terrified of sharks um, as a child we only went on holiday once, but I wouldn't even have a hotel room facing the sea. So it was it was absurd, my fear of sharks. I'm Is rational. yours to blame? Maybe. Like yeah, look, I'm a yeah. child of the 80s, definitely. <laughs> um, and my mum used to say from the library, I'd collect books on sharks. and I had them under my pillow and I was obsessed, but terrified. Mm. And um, when I went to audition as a presenter, the job I went for was the Pepsi chart show you might rem you're probably too young to remember that but it was I like a that. so I thought that'd be good anyway the producer called me and he was like you're not I don't you're you're too um what did he say erratic for for a live tv but we want you to do a wildlife show and I was like okay great brilliant and he said and your first job is a great white shark dive in <laughs> South Africa <laughs> I think the universe has a great sense of humor sometimes. It's like, oh, so I can remember on the phone thing going, yes, amazing. But inside I was dying and I thought, how am I going to, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. So anyway, I went to see a hypnotherapist who gave me six sessions. And what happens in hypnotherapy is you go into your unconscious and you touch on the matter that needs to be dealt with, but you don't process it because there isn't space it kind of just shuts it out and I was taken to quite a dark place like a kind of threatening 
fear-filled place, which I didn't know at the time, but later found out in therapy, my kind of um, fear of sharks and the ability to keep myself away from sharks was a mechanism to control very difficult feelings and you know particularly around relationships with close people in my family and I'd created an environment which is I'm never going to come into contact with a shark so I can control that so therefore I'm in charge of this part and some yeah. years later I mean I got through the shark dive it was awful I was so traumatized. <laughs> oh honestly when you look at the fit footage of my son who's 17 when he saw it he's like you don't look like yourself mummy and I was like <laughs> a zombie and um yeah just a horrible feeling and it oh it's awful have you ever done do you dive no really oh that. It, it was anyone... awful <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but yeah I kind of got to the root cause of that and um and managed to work through it and now I'm not scared of the sea that's not because I did the shark dive that terrified me more I'm not gonna lie <laughs> but but the doing the therapy work you know our unconscious yeah. is often symbolized by the sea it's very common for people to have issues mm. thoughts curiosity about the depths of the sea I mean it's a Jungian theory but that the water and the sea is representative of of matter we're not processing sure. unconscious material so that yeah. was a moment in therapy where it wasn't very often in therapy where the dots get joined it's not super clear but you start to feel something's making sense something mm. is making sense here inside of me and now I can I can feel those feelings and I I you know that that yeah. kind of that's kind of what happened so that that was a big a kind of big moment I think um and I think it's having a guide isn't it to take you there because you yeah. you, you probably wouldn't be able to get there yourself and it's and it's and it's too and even if you were touching on it, it's too overwhelming it's too much but to have somebody who can help like safely take you there and you yeah. just touched on that Jungian um and the type of therapist you had mm. like do you have any advice for because I know at Self Space you have all different kinds of therapists and so there'll be obviously like a like couple therapists and marriage therapists um maybe I don't know if you specialize in like career and stuff like that but then obviously there's the actual styles of therapy do you have any advice for people on finding a therapist that's right for them or finding a style yeah I mean I would say we I get we get asked this a lot we've got a therapy matching service at self space as well which is a human not a robot not a computer it's, it's our beautiful customer service team who match people if you feel overwhelmed the thing I would say about therapy is don't th choosing a therapist don't get too overwhelmed by their credentials and their mm. specialisms unless you're looking for something very niche go to the BACP website which or an affiliated um so you get you know that the quality of therapist you're getting is is uh is right and trained and then go for the chemistry Mm -hmm. Do I like this person? Am I curious about them? How do I feel in their presence? Don't worry too much about, oh gosh, you know, because if we start to look too much at, at what people do, I think we can forget about what therapy is about, which is the relationship with the person. Yeah. It's yeah. the relationship with the person. And, and my encouragement to you is if you don't feel quite right about what's happening in the room or you don't, you're not connecting say it don't just leave and tell it to your mates in the pub tell it say I don't you know I don't agree with what you're saying or I'm finding this uncomfortable because that's the work that's the yeah. that's the relational work even if you've got to leave that therapist because you know it's not right have the conf you know have, have a bit of conflict have the have the conversation because that way you'll take something from the experience rather than just oh that wasn't good and therapy is not good mm. which is often what happens you know I see hundreds of clients over the years and they'll say oh I wish I'd met you before or you know my last therapist was awful I just left and I, well maybe they weren't or maybe there was something yeah. that you could have taken from that um but do follow your gut yeah. also know you're in charge of your own journey so I think there used to be a kind of old fashioned view that the therapist has all the answers and that we're the font of knowledge. And, and yes, we do have a lot of training, a lot of training and a, a lot of skills, 
but you're the expert on yourself. Mm. We're here to be curious, to champion you when you're struggling, to kind of hold a mirror up and say, hang on, how about, have you looked at, you know, this is what I'm noticing, mm. what about you? Um, and to also call you out when you're, when when things are not, you know, maybe landing with you. So I think it's a very special relationship or can be with 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 your therapist. And you are the co-creator of that relationship. Yeah. And, and you do talk in the book, actually, a lot of it is about relationships mm-hmm. with yourself, or probably primarily, but actually relationships generally, because that is just life, isn't it? <laughs> and most of us are like, I don't need to be in therapy. This person needs to be in therapy. But even early on in the book, you guys say, um, anything, any relationship that you bring into the therapy room, you will bring it back to the individual and yeah. their their part in it, their part in the situation or how it's, you know, how it's affecting them, how they can deal with it, because it's all about we're choosing and we're co-creating those relationships. Definitely. And all the while we, you know, we blame other people or we're constantly fixated on what another person is doing we don't have any power we give up our power because if it's all about them I can't do anything about it whereas if it's about me and how I'm showing up or how you are you've got all the power then and so so Mm -hmm. I do think that is um you know that doesn't um just you know not abusive very dysfunctional relationships that is different but in in normal more everyday relationships the 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 thing the person to look at always is yourself and your relationship to yourself what mm-hmm. work are you doing what what are you finding challenging what patterns can you see here does this yeah. feel familiar um how am i not taking care of myself you know so many people come to therapy and they'll be you know desolate or they'll arrive and they you know and i'll say have you had any water today no okay why all oh, right, yeah, okay, I'm thirsty. We get so disconnected from yeah. self-care in in difficult times that, yeah. you know, we do have a lot at our fingertips to help ourselves, actually. Um, yeah. And I think we can forget, we can forget that when we're, we're struggling. Um, Absolutely. I th- and I think that's what the book does so well. It's kind of, it does remind you of the basics as well. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, it's great to it's great to go deep and journal and, and look at your your childhood and stuff but actually yeah have you had enough water are you speaking to your friends did you go outside today or have you been sat at your desk all day mm-hmm. so those kind of things it's such um such a good reminder and I do love how you kind of call out self-help a little bit or like doing too much self-help because yeah. I think a bit like blaming the other person that you were just talking about because that's kind of easier because then I'll just like well it's all their fault and if my boss wasn't like that then my life would be better but we it, that's a kind of like it's probably a um not procrastinating but it's like it's projecting isn't it it's kind of Mm -hmm. moving it away from you the same way I see sometimes we can do that when we're reading too much self-help or kind of you know kind of I've just read another book and then then it'll be fixed and (laughs) And then then I've done the work it's it's almost like an easy it's the easiest part of it which is the academic knowledge you know oh well I know I know about projection and I know about you know a self-sabotage but we don't know it until we come into contact Mm. with the part of ourselves that we don't want to look at you know the bit that's really vulnerable or angry or in pain and Mm. we can make it we can make it so rational and I do think you know there's such a wave around um you know self-help terms being everyone's a narcissist at the minute or you know everyone's a people pleaser and it's like okay we understand the term but until you feel it and its place in your life you don't really understand it um so I think it's quite I'm not sure it's that helpful actually I like the fact we're talking more about mental health and wellness but there's also a dangerous tipping point I think which is we're all therapists now we all know the terms now Mm. all of our partners are you know x y and z or they've got this attachment and that and it's like okay that's one this is this is some understanding which is better than none but now let's let it go and let's do the real work let's get our hands applying it yeah (laughs) yeah you can see this 
you must guys will see do you see trends then in people kind of coming in like self-diagnosing or like, or yes. like deciding that, that, that like you must see it kind of come and go yeah self-diagnosing everyone else first <laughs> yeah um <laughs> relate to that <laughs> and exactly and I've got this sorted I just want to run it past you and get you to validate it yeah, and then I, I know that of... I'm right please <laughs> <laughs> exactly so then I'm like let's just let it go like tell me about you like I'm not mm-hmm. really interested in them I'm interested in you and also the other thing that I I'm particularly fond of is I'm not that interested in in a, my client's diagnosis because I think proper diagnosis from the hospital or the doctors, I will take a brief look, but let me meet you as you are. And then mm-hmm. we can wonder about you as opposed to fixing everything on this diagnosis that I have, which mm-hmm. is now become the thing I orientate myself toward. Um, that's where I look for safety and stability is, oh, that makes sense to me. And I understand that, but I think it's also dangerous. I don't think it gives us a, I think it's quite binary. It doesn't give us a huge amount of freedom and flow and kind of flexibility around who we are and our mental health. Mm. Um, I don't remember what your actual question was, but I just went off the tangent. <laughs> no, that's fine. I was just talking about trends. Trends, oh, in, yeah. like, trends in mental health, like everything else. And I think it's great that you are saying, it's great that we're talking about it more and everything you do is around um mental maintenance so it's like mental health is something we should be looking after all the time and yeah. not expecting that when the ship hits a fan that we just got it because unless we practice it we don't we won't but yeah no yeah it's 100 percent. and i i do think even then you're still gonna feel shit sometimes it yeah. doesn't matter how much therapy you've had how many books you've read how much how much you Damn it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> That you're still going to struggle because this is the human, this is what we do as humans. This is, we're feeling beings and feelings can be horrible and unquantifiable and difficult and irrational. And yeah, that's unfortunately and also fortunately who we are. Yeah, Um, that's, it's riding it all out, isn't it? Experiencing it all and and but I think for lots of us, me, I'm outing myself here, but I know other people on the on the call. It's like feelings have been something we have not been happy to hang out with for a long time. No. So it's like you're kind of like you know inviting inviting them in. So so I'm doing sober twenty twenty four, mm. and um, in March I basically was like just kind of like crashing and burning a bit, and because mm. I was just feeling all this stuff that was coming up, and I wasn't able to. Well, I was able to, but I chose not to have mm. a drink to to numb it to out. Take like the edge before. off. Yeah. Uh, and my friend was like, you chose this. You chose yeah. it. This is what you want. And this is and this is what it's like. I was yeah. like, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I've known that before. I might because not have signed up for it. Exactly. And also we're not super aware that that's what oh, often we don't know. Oh, I'm I'm overspending or I'm overeating or I'm over, you know, because I I'm scared of my feelings. We don't. We just think this is our life mm. phase or this is what we're doing. And actually that's what's so painful and difficult about stripping away some of that stuff is all oh, right here I am right in the eye of this funny thing this this yeah I don't feel good I don't feel myself I feel small or I feel meh you know whatever it is um it but it it's a good thing because yeah. from that place you can absolutely know that you were built for this yeah you were built for feeling and I I really believe we are built for it it's just that we've become so used to quick fixes we've been so used to the shame around sharing and you know all of that stuff that that we're we're a little out of touch with yes you know with it all yeah and I and I think we can be scared of feelings then because we're so used to shutting them down so what I'm learning is like when you do sit with it and let it feel it it finishes it ends and and something else comes in its place and it's like and that actually is really that's great knowledge isn't it because that means that when anything happens it's like oh you know I can I can sit through this because things like this have happened before and it's exactly we 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 start to trust ourselves so much more you know, the things that rob us of our sense of self, like alcohol, too much alcohol, or, you know, things that 
coping defense mechanisms they they don't help us to trust ourselves because we can't find ourselves so we we don't know okay i do got this even though it's horrible and mm. i think um confidence comes from that place which is i trust myself yeah yeah absolutely and, and, and you've mentioned the word curious a few times and i think that's such a, such a great word with regards to this with regard to therapy with a book about therapy it's like just get curious about yeah why wonder you do about things, it or why you don't want to feel certain things yeah um, yeah, I think yeah and I think sense. that's such a good you know it's so good in anything in life to be a bit curious isn't it I really wonder why I'm doing that or mm. you know I wonder why my relationship with my kids is you know wonder what's going on here because mm. that's the first part isn't it is acknowledging when we wonder we allow a space for creative thinking you know, and that's what I think therapy is really great for, which is Tracy Chapman in one of her songs, she talks about the pictures, the pictures in the space between. And the way I understand that is it's about two people and the pictures that the conversation creates space for. I'll have my pictures, whatever that is, and you'll have yours. And that's what I think therapy can do. It can create a different picture, a different shape, a different, you know, a different sense of curiosity about the same issue that you might have been playing over and over um yeah so yeah getting curious with yourself and really curious not just about the nice stuff but about the you know all the, of it all, all of, it. of it yeah all of um, it on that note then shall we do shall we do a little bit of getting curious yeah <laughs> Let. guys we were we were gonna do um jody's gonna lead us through a few of the reflective questions from the book um so don't worry you don't need to have the book yet or have read it but i just thought if you wanted to do take some time to have a think about these questions and either you can uh, write down your answers or you can share them in the chat if you're feeling brave and i think we were going to do something from well on the idea of us all being a bit messy right because i think you guys do talk about like we said earlier we are messy we're all messy and this is like this is life. <laughs> so yes. let's embrace that. Yes. So this is this chat. The chapter is we're all a bit messy. And the subheading is we're all a beautiful mess in this um in this uh section. Okay, so it may be um you've got a notepad or pen, maybe notes in your phone, although don't look at your phone if you can help it. So some questions, and then what I'll do is um, just give you a, a 30 seconds, a minute. Just notice I my encouragement to you is to write down the first things that come into your mind. Don't edit yourself because they're often the most useful. All right. So the first one is, do you often compare yourself to others? you can also write in the chat if you want to okay next one do do you judge your own difficult complex messy emotions against others maybe their perceived order or togetherness they seem like they've got it all together or i'm not as good as them do you do that lots of yeses for that <laughs> yes yes yeah. me too why is my house not all beige and wicker? That's what I often think when I look on Instagram. Um, all right. Do you label your own success or failure based on what you perceive as the difference between yourself and others? E.g. I'm not successful because they're earning more money or I'm not successful because they have a, look like they have a happy marriage, let's say. Yes, a hundred percent. Yes, yes. <laughs> same, same. I feel like the, are these trick questions? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes for all of them. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. All right. What really? What relationship do you have with your own messiness? Um. What's your own relationship to it? So, do you want to disregard it? Are you connected? Are you compassionate toward it? When you think about yourself as a mess. What's your response? Mm. Oh. 
kind and caring. That's good. Mm. Mm. Evolving. Betty Middle. Mm. Like that. Yeah, I don't love my messiness, I must say. I find well, I it... can see your jean collection and it looks look very <laughs> neat and tidy to me. <laughs> That's taken a, that takes a lot of will that. Um I'd rather feelings were just in silo and super simple to understand. I do find the messiness um complicated. You've been teaching people about self-compassion, insecure, mm. disappointed and a bit sad. Yeah, I get that. And also loneliness, I think, lives in the messy part of ourselves, doesn't it? Because often we feel it's so hard to reveal the depth of our mess that we're often alone in it, you know. How has your relationship to your own difficult feelings or messiness, how's that been shaped? How might that have been shaped? Was it in your family? Was there kind of you know, wipe your tears, pull yourself together type mm -hmm. energy. Maybe there wasn't room for failure. Quite often there's a like, what will the neighbours think, isn't there? Or like, mm. like, pull yourself together. Yeah. And that's so, no role models. Yeah, no one modelling how to be with difficult matter. No reflection. Mm so important you know even that very like key thing it's so relieving when someone says oh you look a bit upset oh yeah I am <laughs> oh right okay you know and with children it's such a good skill you look quite stressed or mm -hmm. you seem a bit something naming it so powerful stiff upper lip very British Put on a brave face and fake it until you feel better. Yes. Yeah. Go on, go back out there. Off you go. Get, get you know. in with the shark. <laughs> yeah, get on with it. What's wrong with you? You're so lucky. That's such a great job, you know, or whatever. Everyone... I mean, that is, I love that for an extreme example of like, yeah. like you can do anything for the right job. <laughs> exactly. Just get in there. Shamed for being upset. Yeah. Gosh. So, so many people's childhoods shamed by feeling or why are mm. you so miserable or, you know, overexcitement, calm down. These things that we don't really, we can't really do as children, not unless we're taught mm. the skills of self-soothing. And most of us aren't, right? Most no. No, had to be seen and not heard and stop showing off. Yeah, you big show off. That is, you know, that the idea of being our confidence being knocked, you know, mm. you should feel grateful. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we don't feel, you know, even if our life is seemingly good, you know, the that, that has really no effect on what happens in our inner world. You're overtired. Everything's about being overtired, isn't it? Go and have a nap and you'll feel better. <laughs> really, will I? Thank you. Um, confusion over shame and guilt feelings. Yeah, so difficult. Um, okay, that's kind of similar. We, I think we sort of talked about this, but what do you remember about how your caregivers responded to your emotions when you were young? I think we've kind of covered quite a lot mm. of those there. There's a kind of sense of just dismissive. Yeah, you, it's so minimizing, isn't it? You know, and I see it still now, this idea that kids are a bit yucky if they're a bit messy. You know, I'll wipe your snotty nose. Okay, let's, you know, let's clean you up. Of course, I get that. But mm. what does that say? It says, you know, you're too much, you're too... Yeah messy or too sticky or dirty or blah, 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 this type of language and also you know how we receive children and how we're received and you notice it in therapy I notice it a lot with clients now even as adults they're so embarrassed to cry or everyone says sorry 
sorry for crying why are you sorry it's the most human thing you know and what a privilege to sit with someone who's who's able to cry and show you but you know they reach for tissue they want to to don't kind of don't look you know and I think that it's very early early developmental stuff so do you think then we were saying earlier how most of us we're very like embarrassed about our messiness almost or it's something that you it's very hard to be honest about and that mm. comes from it being a source of shame possibly I think so I think as parents we shouldn't beat ourselves up about these things that we've probably all done to our children and will have been done to us but I do think the way that we learn to be validated in our feeling, accepted, shown how to be with our feeling comes comes from our early experiences. And often later in life, we're relearning that. Mm -hmm. And what happens, you see, is where it's an environment where it's not accepted, we just learn not to feel. We just shut it down. We brush yeah. it away. We hide it under makeup or eating challenges or whatever it is. We find a way to to repress it. Um, and I do think that's quite common, to be honest. Mm. Crying with street is I'll give you something to cry about. Yes, yes. You're not valid in just crying for for, for because you're sad. Mm. Um. Yeah. And then, and then, and then as, as, as adults kind of understanding this about ourselves, so obviously like this group, it's, it's, it, we are quite self-aware that that's mm -hmm. what we're spending our time doing. Um, and like you said, sometimes it, well, sometimes it's not that fun and it's not that nice, but then I think what we're learning is like sharing it with other people, like in a situation like tonight is actually quite cathartic and it's quite soothing. So obviously sharing with a therapist one-on-one -on -one is like a, is a super powered version of that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, finding ways to reveal yourself to people that you trust and love is very powerful in terms of feeling less alone, relieving shame, you know, even if it's just, yeah, I'm not feeling, I'm not doing good. I don't, mm. I don't know what it is, but I don't feel great. I feel a bit small. And somebody said to me actually last week, you only need one person that really, really knows you. One person is enough. Right. Um, to really, you know, and whether it's voice noting, I have a, a friend who we voice note every single day, a few times a day, really that stuff. I feel, you know, this is how I feel today and this is what's happening. Mm. And it's very so it simple. It doesn't even need to be a two-way conversation. It's just you you know that you're being heard. That's I think that's such a lovely idea. Especially yeah, if you're I love not that. Used, especially if you're um nervous about having those kind of conversations or not used to it as well. Yeah. And people actually, you know, other people love you to share because it enables them to share. Sorry, my dog's crying and I'm not gonna smack him for it, considering what we've just been talking about. <laughs> um but but yeah, I do think finding little ways to to show yourself is is what we all want. And Winnicott says he was a brilliant psychotherapist, pediatrician. He says it's a joy to be hidden, but a disaster not to be found. And I think that is, you know, very um, true for, for 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 us as humans. It's like. We love the idea that, you know, we're putting a mask on and no one can really see us. But actually, if we stay that way too long, it's an actual disaster. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, how we find ways to show up um, authentically is, yeah, so important. Mess yeah. and all. Yeah. Um, actually, we had this, we've got a tote bag that says, I don't know if you've got one, Tony, but we, it says I'm a mess on it. And we were, we were presented to Gareth Southgate last week for for something and I gave him one of those totes <laughs> he's had this amazing vision of him being in the press with an I'm a mess tote bag I was like <laughs> how great would that be for the England manager to representing <laughs> and say I'm a mess yeah but um <laughs> <laughs> amazing 
amazing <clears throat> and also that's kind of it's brought us back as you were just saying it's just kind of brought us back to the beginning when you were talking about um it's not always easy to kind of have these conversations or um to to start the process like we have to like we to, you, you were to, we were talking about the kind of the dinner and making people uncomfortable by asking these deep questions but being getting uncomfortable enough to have a conversation with a friend is like the value of it is so huge so on the other side of that discomfort is is so much so it's always worth it a hundred percent you'll you won't ever regret it I don't think I think mm. if it's in the right space you know we hear it a lot don't we like if you if you listen to drunken late night ramblings in the toilets of bars or clubs or at the bar everyone wants to share themselves but they can't yeah. do it and you know that's often the most unvalidating place to do it because no one's really listening every mm. you know but but it does it shows up if we don't find and cultivate ways to do it therapy is a good one having a good mm. trusted friend is another you know, there are journaling is a great one. You know, I'm sure you've talked about it on here. I'm not I'm not um, I'm not a massive fan of gratitude journaling, actually, because I, I think it helps. But I think it also disallows all our ungrateful feelings. And I, I, I much mm. prefer ingratitude journaling. But that's also <laughs> another quite, you know, nice place to share. And I'll often ask my clients to bring in, you know, their journals. Or, or, and share a bit from that or the notes on your phone you know kind of yeah those types of things I would say if you're constantly met with judgment or challenge or feeling invalidated when you share feelings with someone don't keep knocking on that door yeah mm -hmm. Because we often, what we do, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We sort of do it and we go, well, I'm not doing that again because that was, they didn't meet me in the way I feel I wanted to be or needed to be met. And I think that's sometimes a way of us just kind of stopping ourselves from doing it. And kind of somewhere we knew that yeah. that was what we were going to get. So now I don't have to try it again. <laughs> yeah, I won't do that again. Yeah, I won't do You'll that. Say, keep trying and with the right person. With the right people. It. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Um, I've seen one question in the chat. We've only got a few more minutes left. Um, time flies when you're talking about therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if you've got any questions quickly, just to drop, drop them in the chat. I think it was Jackie asked about being sensitive. Let me just find that. Um, what can you do if you're quite sensitive? Can you be oversensitive? It's one of the questions. Mm, that's something you've heard I think someone said you're oversensitive or this idea that you're too much no I think sensitivity is such a beautiful brilliant quality because it helps us to understand the world and to to really um to be really sensitive even though it can be incredibly painful is I think you know one of the closest things to empathy that we can you know actually because um we feel it all when we're very sensitive and i guess it's about understanding ways in which you can look after yourself which it, it might be um you know minimizing contact with too many people at once or having enough time to meditate there's a great guy called um yogi brian he's the sweary yogi meditation guy but he does just 10 it's free it's on youtube 10 minutes seven minute meditations and I think they're great I think it's called the no fucks meditation or something like that but it's good it's, it's what it's really if you're not a meditator it's good so ways to take care of yourself but relinquish yourself from the idea that you're too oversensitive because I don't believe there is any too oversensitive you know whatever. thank you um Brian has asked a question about um I think just what we were talking about about Keep, don't keep knocking on that door if you're sharing difficult things repeatedly with a partner who struggles with validating your feelings do you keep trying or go to a friend instead um have a do have a listen to esther perel she's a brilliant german um psychotherapist one of the leading voices in psychotherapy she has um a podcast called where should we begin which is couples in therapy and I find it so interesting to listen to those stories, actually. It, it's well worth listening. I I do think in in it with within a couple, it only takes one of you to change. 
actually to make change. It's a misconception that you've both got to change. Yes, you've both got to want the same thing, but even if it's just you in therapy or you changing, um, and in therapy, you might learn ways to talk with your partner that open up a different channel. What's difficult is if we keep trying the same way, the same thing. Mm. Yeah. That often doesn't um, give us what we need. But relationships are very difficult. All relationships, yeah. the cause of the most pain for people and challenge um there was another question we want it to be different don't we we want it to be different so so we're just going to keep doing the same thing and doing the same thing and then when we get the same outcome we're going to wonder about that um if you if you were in charge of mental health services in the uk what would be the first thing that you would change are all school age children or teenagers um receiving free proactive mental health support and therapy so that they learn mm. skills for adult life, um, that when they were adults, they had a much better experience of how to talk about their feelings. If we'd all experienced mm. some type of therapeutic relationship as adolescents and you know younger people, I think we'd be we'd be a, an incredible generation right now. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then and if you didn't get taught that, then you read books like this yeah that's exactly why we're doing it isn't it yes. we didn't it's stuff we didn't learn we're teaching yeah. it ourselves now guys instead <laughs> thank you so much Jodie Karras um it's been awesome to hang out with you next up yeah I've right? loved it Everybody. thank you someone <laughs> said Bristol Bristol is on our scale plan actually and chances from Leeds so yeah we've got some ideas about some mobile vans so let's see oh my god amazing and yeah. Norwich Put yes. on there, please, as well. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight, guys. I think some of you are reading already. If not, get the book and we start reading next week. So thank you for being here, everyone, and sharing so much. And um, I hope you've enjoyed. It looks like everybody has enjoyed a lot. So, yeah, have Good. a wonderful week. Thank we'll you, you so much. Time. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.